Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast. This week on the Sportlight Podcast, we're going to talk to Jeff Ginn, who is a longtime soccer coach who's coached soccer with youth all the way up to professional soccer. And he made a comment in one of our presentations to the Utah Youth Soccer Association earlier this spring where he said, youth coaches are the most well-intended liars on the face of this planet. We had to talk to him about that statement and what he said was pretty profound and has a lot of implications in our coaching and parenting. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast for parents, coaches, and athletes. The Sportlight refers to the time in an athlete's life when they have increased ability to affect the culture around them and the increased opportunity to learn life's lessons through sports. This podcast aims to help parents and coaches capitalize on their athletes' precious time in the Sportlight. The Sportlight Podcast is brought to you by Especially for Athletes program. Well, for those of you who don't know Jeff, our, our guest today... Jeff is the coaching director for Northern Utah United Soccer Club, and and Jeff has had many experiences in coaching. You've coached Jeff at the youth level. You've coached at the uh, college level. You've also coached at the professional level, and both men and women soccer, if I understand your bio correctly. And and so quite the experience in, in soccer. You've gone the full gamut there of, of coaching experience, it sounds like. Yeah, I've had a, a lot of different experiences that have kind of shaped how I how I pre how I view how we should be introducing our sport to the youth. Yeah. And it's kind of cool that you've gone that because some of the things we're gonna talk about today, you know, you've coached very young youth and all the way up to professional soccer as we just talked about, but but kind of having that full spectrum in your mind, I'm sure changes some of your perspective in regard to coaching youth and what we might be doing or what we should be doing, I guess, is a better way to say it, with our young people at that youngest stage of development up through the professional ranks. And so I, w- I would love maybe to begin, what has that taught you as you've gone from very young soccer players all the way to professional what what lessons have you learned about the way we should be coaching young people well i think the first thing that i've i've acknowledged as i've gotten a little bit more mature is the ability to self-reflect and and accept that there's some things that i did in the past that were wrong or misguided And I think that the different perspectives of the different um, types of soccer environments I've been part of has helped shape uh, a better understanding for me, which I believe in clarity. I think that it's really important that players, parents, coaches, myself are have clarity in whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. And I don't think that that was necessarily my goal in the beginning when I first started coaching way back in 1998. Now, I started off and it was just because I loved soccer and I got asked to coach and, and just fortunately fell in love with that side of coaching. I was at the time I was playing club soccer at Utah Valley. And that was a great experience that I didn't anticipate in my youth, but I think that the different perspectives that I've had have really allowed me to look at the audience that I have. It's made it so I can't do the same thing with a four-year-old as I, I do with the 20 year old goalkeeper or 23 year old goalkeeper that just got done playing at college um, and now has stepped into the semi professional ranks. I had to learn a lot. There was a learning curve there in regards to jumping from youth to adults. And I've done that back and forth in my career. I think that the biggest thing, though, is just recognizing your audience and understanding what their needs are as individuals. And then, secondly, as a collective. Awesome. So we went and met with all of the soccer clubs with the Utah Youth Soccer Association at the Marriott Hotel in Provo, Utah, uh, back in the the beginning of this year. And, And you were there in some of those presentations. And one of the things that you mentioned in a breakout group when Dustin and I were, were talking with some of the coaches and directors there is you said youth coaches are the most well intended liars on the face of the planet. And yeah, I get, I get a lot of eyebrows raised when I say that. 
<laughs> well, and it, and it raised my eyebrows, but I kind of saw what you were saying. And as you went on to explain it, that's one of the reasons why I thought, man, I'd love to talk to Jeff on a podcast and get his thoughts and feelings on on this matter. T first, tell us what you mean by that eyebrow raising comment that youth coaches are some of the most well intended liars on the face of the planet. Um. I, I like the shock value of it first because it, now it makes people think. It makes people like really question what it is that they're telling people. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that it instantly puts people into a reflection mode. I think that's, I, I also do instruction for U.S. soccer for coaching education. And I kind of make sure that that see, seeps into those conversations. And I love that moment where they start to recognize, man, what have I been telling my players? And what have I been telling my parents? And is that reality? Is that true? Do I even know what I'm really talking about? For example, we have parent coaches that are giving their all. They're busting their butts. Most of the times not, not pay, not getting paid. And they have this perception of, well, if we're part of this group or part of this organization, or if we do this thing right, or if we put in all the work, then we're going to get this huge reward of playing pro or college or whatever it may, may be. And then they have the other spectrum where you have the parents that just feel like signing their kid up is good enough. And they're going to get the, they're going to get the benefits of that environment. And it doesn't matter how much they participate. And so there's, there's two parts of it is that are we really, are we really guiding the adults to understand one, what their role is in the player's development um, and enjoyment in the sport and the enjoyment in the process. And then the second is, are we giving them false um, false hope? In, 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 in other words, are we telling them that if they do this, they're automatically gonna get this? Mm -hmm. We have, that anyone that's been through the process realizes that there's a small percentage of players that actually reach the highest level of their sport. I, I have a full conversation about that whole dialogue too, but we'll we'll try to go away from that as much as possible. Because I think that the numbers are skewed a little bit in regards to, we actually have a lot of kids that do go on to play at high levels. And they're the ones that decide that they actually want to drive, to dig in and drive and do the work. Um, but we're all told that, um, we're commonly told that if we just participate, that we'll get there. Right. And... And if we just follow this one coach or this one club and it limits our ability to, or it limits the parents ability to make sure that their kids in the right environment. So a lot of the times we get to the point where we're telling the kids, parents, what they want to hear. So we have high retention numbers instead of telling them what they need to hear or what we think is the honest truth in fear of losing those players. Cause that's and financial, think, right? Like when you're, it, I remember when you were talking about this there that, you know, you have soccer clubs and sometimes you have a kid who really needs to hear something, whether about their attitude or their performance or their position on the team or whatever. But but retention on a soccer club, when that becomes more important than the progression of a youth athlete, then that's where we start being these well-intended liars. Right. And I, and I would be willing to say that it, it starts even a step earlier is that we we never inform. And I, I say inform instead of educate because I think educate's a little degrading. But I, we fail to inform the, the parents in the early stages. And then what we generally do is we go out and pluck the athletic kids so we can have success on game day and limit the need for us to actually have to teach. And so what happens is that we start telling all these kids if we do x y and z and we have all the athletes and they have immediate success that success at 8 9 10 11 years old is also going to equivalent to success at 18 20 24 26 27. the reality of it is in in our sports and people might argue this but i i use this as a i use this analogy or I use this reference quite a bit in my coaching education courses is I asked the I asked the coaches, generally speaking, our parent coaches, at what age does a player peak in our sport? And the common question is, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe 22 comes out there. 
in soccer, it's 27. And so I put, I try to put some things into perspective that when talking to parents and parent coaches and novice coaches, your kid's nine years old. They've been playing soccer for three years. They're on year three of 21 of their process. What do you really expect from them? And so I think that that line, it it helps me stay accountable to what I'm trying to accomplish as well as try to mentor others. Simply puts it into perspective that let's stop, let's stop telling people what they want to hear and start telling people what they need to hear, which is it's a struggle. It's a process. Your kid's not as good as so-and-so. Your kid can be as good as so-and-so if you do X, Y, and Z. And that differs from every player. Some player, it's some players. I have some players right now that train too much. And then I have some players that don't touch a ball outside of their team. Well, that's what we talk about getting to the individuals. Are we actually talking to the parents, telling what their individual kids' needs are? Yeah, that's great. You mentioned a few minutes ago that some club directors, for example, will pluck talent at a young age which brings success maybe to the club or to the team or whatever that might be. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those kids who are uber athletic at that age maybe have developed faster than other kids. You know, when we get to ages nine through 13, nine through 14, it's like kids are developing. All of a sudden one will shoot up and and if it's just sheer size, you know, they're going to be a star right or speed because of their size or whatever and then other kids are going to catch up and we have talked about this before on our podcast that sometimes that peaking early or that early athletic development with a kid it it can if coaches and parents aren't intentional if they're just plucking kids and putting them on their team and then trying to win soccer games or any games because of athleticism alone, we might be limiting that kid by not telling them what they need to hear because that athletic ability, just because they peaked a little bit physically before other kids, that eventually that's all going to equal out. And of course, some kids will always be more athletic than others, but if they get lazy in their training, or if they're not being told things that they could do technically to be a better soccer player or basketball player or baseball player or whatever it might be, that's really limiting to that kid by telling them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear because then they'll they'll stop training, stop trying to get better. And then we, we have this phrase that we like to use, um, seek to be your best, not the best, because we don't want that being the best for a kid who peaks early and all of a sudden they think, man, I am God's gift to soccer, for example, and look what I could do to all these other nine, 10, 11 year olds. If they are not intentional in their training and trying to improve, they're going to be passed up and they may not reach their full potential, which could have been great, could have been amazing. And so I love how you say that plucking talent, it, it takes the development away from coaches where they they maybe aren't concentrating as much on development yeah we we um there's a small circle of people in our in our soccer world that refer to a coach as either a soccer or a player user or a player developer Hmm. so we're always looking to see who the coaches are that are willing to take um the less prepared player and actually help them rise up um, there's an educator in Belgium who I do a lot of following. I follow a lot of his stuff, but he compares individuals to bananas. And he talks about how there's green bananas and then there's spoiled bananas. And usually what happens is we take those bananas that are ready to eat and we give it all the attention and spoil them. And on the other spectrum, we have the green bananas that aren't even ready to, haven't even had a chance to blossom or, or ripen. And we just discard them and throw them away. And we do this. It it sounds crazy when you just think about that process. Why would you ever throw a green banana away? (laughs) But in all reality, I really do think that the vast majority of the reason why we have dropout in sports is because those green bananas don't get attention. They never get the opportunity to be told, all right, you're in this, you're in this position. We need to go. We need to do this process for you. 
And then the, the ones that are ready for it, you need more attention. You need a little bit more specific attention, not just, well, we're just going to let you be you because you're good. And we're just going to use you during that process. Right. Hmm. And so it's recognizing that you have a spectrum of players that are from top to bottom, even on 18 man roster, that there's a, could be a completely different contrast in those players. Even on a seven man roster, there could be a completely different contrast. How are you creating an environment for each one of those individuals to thrive? And are you being honest in that process? Right. We have set up in our in our organization, we actually have a four tier uh, color system. And it's for our coaches, which are volunteer coaches for the most part, to indicate where they're at amongst their peers. And it's really based off of confidence. It's not necessarily based off of their skill or the athleticism. It's when you step on the field, are you confident with the tools that you have accessible to you? Um, and then the second part is, do they have an impact in the game? Positive impact. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting as I share this process to other directors, other, other people in our sport. The first question is like, how are the parents handling that? And it's quite honestly, I get a lot of praise for the fact that their kids, their parents, they, they know where their kids are sitting. And they also, at the same time, know that we care enough to tell them that and care enough to try to provide a plan or an environment for them to thrive, regardless of the spectrum that they're on. Yeah, I could see that being upsetting if you didn't do that second part, right? If it was just, okay, we're just going to label your kid and we're going to tell them where they are in relation to other kids then I could see parents being like, ah, don't do that. You know, I don't, I don't want them compared to all the other kids or whatever. But when you're doing it and your organization is doing it, it sounds to me from what you just said, like you are saying, okay, let's look at where we're at because we want to come up with a really good plan for how to help your, your child, your athlete to develop into what they would like to become. Because recognizing where we're at and being honest with ourselves is a really important part of of knowing where we want to go. If if right now we wanted you and I wanted to get to New York City, you know, well, it depends on where we're at that would determine right. what directions we give, right? If you're in Florida, I'm in California, then uh, you know, for you it's drive north, for me it's drive east, right? And right. so so knowing where we're at is a really important part of development and sometimes when we're dishonest about where a kid's at to keep them on our roster or to make sure that they're, they don't get their feelings hurt. And of course there's appropriate ways to do these things. We wouldn't crush a kid or something right. like that, but that's but, definitely not the goal. Right. But in a very honest, authentic and genuine way, letting them know, okay, here's where I see you. Here's where you're at. And I know you want to get here. So here's how we can help you to get there. If I understand your phrase, going back to that, youth coaches are the most well-intended liars on the face of the planet. Sometimes we're not very good at telling kids where they are for fear of losing them off our roster or whatever. Or discouraging them from continuing on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I played baseball up until I was 12, 13 years old. It wasn't my first thing. I loved going. I loved participating. I loved being involved. Soccer was my thing. I had a moment where basketball was my thing, but soccer was really always my consistent uh, activity. Um, but I remember I, I, I worked all season long on pitching. And I finally got the opportunity to go up and throw a ball. And I'm not a good baseball player, admittedly, was not good. Um, but I quit after this game. And I'll never forget this game. Uh, we're playing against the Oakland A's in Southern California. And my coach finally goes, hey, you're going to pitch. And we're, I'm pitching against the worst team in the league at the bottom three of their roster. I struck all three of them out. And we were winning by a significant amount of, significant amount of runs. And I went in and the, the coach's son walked in and he says, I'm pitching the next. And I was like, what? I just struck three guys out. Like, yeah, and the coach never even confronted me. He just put his son in and replaced me. Never once had dialogue with me, never had. And so maybe some of this stems back to some of the emotional 
you know, for, you know, emotional issues I had with growing up myself. But that moment sticks out to me unlike any other moment in my entire sports career. The, the coach didn't even have the courage to come in and say, good job, and acknowledge that I, I had been working on something and, and actually had success when I was actually given the opportunity. And then even worse, buried me by not even letting me try against the top of the roster of the worst team. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I yeah, think if it's I hear you right. I mean, if we're going to be authentic and and we're going to tell kids where they're at, I think communication is really, really important. If that coach would have come to you and said, hey, Jeff, great job, great job pitching. I'm trying to get a lot of people, you know, an opportunity to pitch. That was your inning and kind of here's what I'm thinking. Here's why I'm taking you out now. And great job. You're going to get another chance in the future. That would have felt a lot different than right. just Jeff, my son's pitching. Right. And so sometimes we we tell them what we need to tell them uh, to keep them on our roster or whatever, but we're afraid to have those conversations about what we're thinking. Hey, here's why I started so and so instead of you. Here's why I'm switching your position. I still remember having an experience where I played middle infield in in uh, in high school and in college in baseball. And I had a, a coach, Coach Bothwell. I really love Coach Bothwell. He was a high school coach and and a very good, uh, just a very good person. And he came to me and he told me my my junior year, I always loved playing middle infield. I mean, that's where I was. I just I love shortstop, second base. Yeah. And there was someone else playing second base, and and. I replaced him because he was injured for a game and and played very, very well at second base that game. And I just felt like I was at home and I felt like it was it was good. And and then I got moved back to third base when this guy got healthy and I was a little frustrated about that. And my coach, I thought I was a better second baseman than the guy. But the coach came and he told me two things. First of all, we're a better team with him at second and you at third than with you at second and someone else at third. And uh, and he said, and also, Shad, you're not fast enough to be a professional middle infielder. And if you could put on some weight, if you could lift and put on some weight, I think you have a professional, you have some professional possibilities, but that's probably gonna happen for someone like you who can throw the ball well, and you know if you put on some weight and hit with a little bit more power and and uh i I think third base if you have a professional future it's third base it's not shortstop and second base that communication for me now all of a sudden third base felt a little bit different there was purpose to it and i think too many coaches are afraid to have those conversations and so they leave their kids wondering what's going on in the coach's head and some coaches quite frankly that i've come across in my playing career and with my children and things like that i think they love being in kids heads i think they for whatever reason that power dynamic they like it and it messes with kids and and so i love just this man be authentic and be genuine with kids be honest with kids tell them where you're trying to help them get and usually if they see the vision and understand where they're at, it's way better for them, even if they do choose another opportunity, even if they do look and say, I'm probably not going to play for this club as much as I would like or where I would like. So I think I'm going to go take another opportunity. Being authentic with them, I believe, really helps them develop. Right. I, I think the other one in that whole quote that I gave you was, I think that it stemmed originally from silence meaning that we're lying to kids if we're being silent to them and we're not, we're not telling them anything at all. And I think that that's, I think that's a big oversight on many of us. We get busy, we get, we go overlooked. We have a win. What happens when we win compared to what happens when we lose a game at win, we all celebrate and go off and we're all happy and smiling. When we lose, we get chewed out. We get lectured. We get told all the things that we did wrong. Sometimes Sometimes it needs to be individualized. Sometimes it needs to be a cheer, let everyone go, and then talk to that one individual that had a great game or a bad game and identify their strengths or weaknesses. But I think sometimes we miss opportunities. 
And I think that really that quote stemmed from silence. It's like we're lying to them if we're silent. If we're if we're if we're afraid to tell them where they're really at, um, in their development pathway, and afraid to tell them that, that how difficult it really is, or um, maybe even lie to them in the sense of it's too much. Like you're giving them too much hope, too much opportunity to keep them motivated. You're asking, you're telling them that if you don't mess up, then you have a chance of doing X, Y, and Z and playing at this certain level. Um, I don't know. It's, I think silence is a big part of that, that quote is in the line. Yeah. Now you said something back at the beginning of the podcast that, you know, sometimes we, we limit kids when we don't need to, you know, we talk about how few kids go on and actually have opportunities in soccer and, and uh, we may limit their vision a little bit. So there's one thing of being honest with kids. And then there's another thing about taking away their hopes and dreams when maybe they could have a future and we talk them out of their future. Would you right. tell me a little bit more about what you're seeing there? I'll, I'll, use my, I'll, use, I'll use my childhood growing up a little bit and hopefully it relates. I grew up near a beach and every summer I wanted to go surfing. And on my walls was nothing but Tommy Curran uh, posters of surfing, surfers. Um, and I wanted to go to the beach and my mom was making an argument for why I shouldn't go to the beach. Basically, she didn't want to take me at the time. <laughs> but again, her words mattered. Was, I was like, I want to go. And she's like, well, what are you going to do with surfing? You know, you can't, you can't do anything with that. And I was like, what are you talking about? Well, I got all these pros. That, that's all they do. That's their job. And I remember having this conversation and, and that was the moment where my mom destroyed my vision of, I wasn't going to be a surfer, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but my, my, my hopes and dreams were crushed by telling me just, no, you can't do it. Right. So I think that um, part of this is, is getting to the point where we actually are giving the right balance of hope and and genuine direction right and a lot of the, and both those things have one thing in common is that you have to be honest about those two things yeah. i hear a common quote about you know only the, a certain percentage of kids go on to play collegiate or professional soccer and i, I like to skew that quote into the sense of well what's the percentage of kids that really desired to do that and put their heart into it put everything into it from academics to athletics, which are requirements to play collegiately, I think the percentage is actually a heck of a lot higher for the kids that really want to do it and actually do it. And I think that there's a there's a poor message out there that says um, this small percentage of kids on, are the are the ones that make it. So why even try? And the reality is that we they're thirteen, they're ten. They don't know if they want to, they don't know if they want to put on pads all summer long and go do two days, all that kind of fun stuff, right? They don't know that at 12, 13 years old. Or if they realize, realize that soccer, as you get a little bit older, is, you know, the academy system, which was part of it, Real, was twice a day, four days a week, travel on the weekends, you left your home. A small percentage of those guys make it. But when you start really recognizing that are these kids willing to do what it takes to make it, the percentage is a lot higher than we use that, that stat of, well, the kid started playing soccer at 10 years old and he quit at 14, but he's still lumped into that stat. Right. Right. So I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at is we have to be really clear when we use information like that, that the percentages actually increase if you do X, Y, and Z. And a lot of the principles that you guys do with the sport light fall into that, right? The second part along it is that there's a character building side that is really, really relevant in what we perceive. I think our generation perceives as the reason why we do sport. It's slipping. It, right now, we're telling our kids that you play sports for a college scholarship. Right. We're not telling them that, that this is to become a better human being and build character. and and be resilient and all the other fun things that 
seem cliche, but they're actually becoming outdated narratives because the direction of our organizations is success is driven by individual accomplishments that we can put on paper. The kids that went on to play at a high level, the kids that are playing pro, the kids, so on and so forth. We're, we're failing to understand that, that the kids that continue to play our sport and are good people in our community is actually the goal. That's the end game. So I was recently doing a coaching course up here in Cache Valley. And on the other side of the field was a group of 28 to 32 year old women. And I had coached half of them when they were younger. And I asked the coaches that we were in this on the field. And I said, define success. We had actually had the conversation before we went down and I said, define success. Now that we've, you've had time to think about it. And they kind of stumbled and I looked over there and I pointed out these, these women still playing soccer with kids now and, and happy and living uh, vibrant lives. So that to me is success. Those are good human beings contributing to our community, raising good another generation of good kids, still playing the sport that I had a part in. To me, that's success. Good people still playing your sport or still involved in your sport, whether it's playing, refing, coaching, cheering, whatever it may be, I think that we're failing to recognize that, to identify what success is. And I think that we have the cliches, um, the cliche terminology, but we're, we're so hyper-focused on who is the best, who accomplished what. We have a quote in our, in our club um, that says, I'm going to misquote it, but I'm going to, do my best. It says we're we're developing players to value wearing the armband more than being the MVP, and the armband is being the captain. And generally, generally speaking, usually in the soccer world, their teammates select their captain, mm -hmm. and their coaches sometimes select a captain. But usually, what's what's the reason behind an MVP? What's the difference between an MVP and a captain? Uh, the captain's a leader. The captain's the person that brings everyone together. The captain's the, the unselfish person that inspires everyone else, yeah. that is confident, that has character, that has true value in the workforce of a team, not just the person that scores all the goals, gets their names in the paper and all the accolades. Yeah. And so I think that the, the, the underlining point is, that are, we, are we really creating environments that value that more than the headlines or the, the headlines, sorry. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing shift in the mind of a coach. Like, are we intentionally trying to create character to really help youth develop character through sports? Part of what you were talking about before is the small percentage of those who go on and play college and professional yeah, that that is true. But I love what you said too. that there is a price, you know, if you want to play college sports, there is a price associated with it. And we probably shouldn't lump in all of those who were unwilling to pay the price, but then didn't get the opportunity. There, right. there are some of those who I mean, hardest worker on the team, they put in the extra time, and they still don't have that opportunity. But really when we talk about kids just showing up to practice and not even giving full effort in practice you know and we're lumping those into that stat really those who would love to do this um that's a lot higher of a percentage of kids who are willing to pay the price that make it than those who don't and right and for those who don't but they have been the ones that have worked and they have sweat and bled and set goals and got advice and learned to be humble and talk to people. How can I improve? And they've been coached. They've been a great teammate. They've done everything they could in the classroom. And then if that kid doesn't have that opportunity, all is definitely not lost. Right. <laughs> they have developed character. They have learned to work and to set goals. And that is going to go with them. And so setting that trying to pay the price to really achieve at a high level in sports will never go unrewarded it may not be that we have this it, the outcome that we would like 
but it will definitely develop those characteristics. We have someone who's spoken at some of our camps. His name's Bob Cattell. And Bob Cattell, he was a kicker at Brigham Young University. And he tells a story of them coming and no one comes to see the kickers, you know, at BYU. They aren't coming to see the kickers, but but he really wanted to play in the NFL. And so they would come and they would try to, you know, recruit. This is BYU's heyday. Thank goodness we're getting back there, it looks like, you know, <laughs> to have all of our BYU, Utah, like some high level football here uh, in the state of Utah. But but they were coming back in the day to see some of those star BYU players. And, and he would say, hey, I could kick a 50 yard field goal. I forget the story exactly, but he would take him out there. And anyway, he ended up getting a tryout. And then that tryout led to some connections where he never made an NFL roster, but because he was willing to put himself out there and really work and try, he compared it to walking down a corridor of doors. And you're trying to get to that end door in the back but you don't make it there. However, all the doors on the side of that hallway, as they walk by, he kind of shared this analogy that those open up. So even if you don't make it to the door in the back of the hallway, you've opened up all these other doors. And I think that's something that we forget sometimes. It's good for kids to set lofty goals. It's good for them to work and to understand how to, if I want to get to that door, what does it take? Now, even if they don't make it to that door, that's okay. They've opened up so many other doors. And, and when we only measure an organization or a club or, or a sport or whatever by the number of kids who end up walking through that end door at the corridor, I, I think that that's a poor measurement of, of all the good that sports does. I completely agree. I, I think that along, the, along that line as well is that are we creating environments for the kids that are, that are not – that are ambitious, but not good. Meaning that they're not the best. Yeah. If you think about it, are we creating an environment where kids can, can continue to enjoy playing our sport while also playing at their level? And I ask that question quite often because for the most part, I'll speak for soccer, but I think it, I think it's pretty uh, similar in other sports. I think that we cater the way that we design our our sports environment to the top five ambitious percent, the five percent of ambitious players, and we expect that what's good for that top five percent is also good for the middle group or the lower group. And I think that we are not allowing ourselves to recognize the need for that middle level player that just loves the sport to have a place where they can continue to learn these characteristics and and set goals. Uh, and give them opportunities to have that same experience, even though they're not the the star in their community. Uh, I think that I think that that's something that we've got to start evaluating in our in our in our sports clubs and our organizations is the second and third tier level player that loves the sport. It just for whatever reason isn't good at it. Can there be an environment for them to learn these same life lessons and? and keep them in the sport so they can be learning those life lessons, right? Yeah. A lot of the times we're focused on that type of top 5% and cater to them. And that's just not the same and the same necessary environment for other individuals. You know, it reminds me of a, of a conversation I had on the podcast with Ella Ballstead. You might know Ella Ballstead. She played soccer all all here in utah yeah. and then ended up playing at both university of utah and, and byu but yeah. some people will talk about women's sports and they'll say things like you know the wmba why in the world are we investing so much money in the wmba when so few people watch it or you know they they take these shots at women's sports yeah. And to me, those are the most ignorant comments because of the fact that they ignore what sports are really about. Right. Sports are not about making money for people. Like, of course, sports do make money. They're billion dollar industries and everything like that. But, but it's such a naive kind of ignorant comment to pretend as though what women's sports are about 
or what, um, for example, the, the second tier, third tier athlete in a soccer club, what, what it's about is about making money and about all these things instead of character development. Because when you look at Title IX and the wonderful things that have happened because of Title IX and women having the opportunity to play sports, now I have a daughter right now. I don't know what she'll do. You know, she loves tennis. She's playing tennis. Uh, she's playing JV tennis for, for her high school. You know what? Those car ride homes after uh, car rides home after she's lost a match, uh, those are just as important to her as if she was Serena Williams playing in the mm -hmm. national championship. She right. doesn't feel the difference. She's still learning resilience. She's still learning to work really hard. She's still learning to set goals. And for someone to come in and to say, for example, well, I don't know that she's good enough to learn these lessons, these life lessons from sports. Boy, I'd really fight that. I, I would want her to find a place where she could play and learn life's lessons through sports. And so I love what you're saying, Jeff, because I think that if we were to view sports as a tool to help people develop, how would we coach different? How would we run our clubs or our organizations differently if we viewed that? How, how much more would we invest in our parks and recreation systems and things like that if we viewed sports as development instead of as money-making tools right. solely? Right. It's, it's funny. I don't know how it is in the other sports, but soccer is almost cliche for saying, we're a player development club, right? And, but what does that really mean, right? And, and I'm not saying that there is one defined meaning, but each coach, each club, each organization might have their own definition of what player development is, right? And I think that it's, uh, again, going back to that quote, it comes back to when you sign up for a team, a club, or show up for tryouts, um, is it transparent before you show up what it is that you're trying out for? Meaning, sure, you're going to play on this team and maybe it's the top team or the middle team or the lower team. But what does that really mean to be on that team or on, in that club or in that organization? I I really do think that we we fall short that we just look at standings and go, well, if I want to be the best, I should go try out for the best team. That's not always the best environment. It's not, it's generally speaking, it's not the best environment for most kids. But I think that we fail our kids in, in um, not having transparent um, expectations of players, coaches, club, and parents. I think that we fall short on that. And I think that there are players like your daughter that are, she, she might be varsity next year. But it really surrounds uh, two things, or I'd say three things. The environment that the, the organization provides for her, the support that her parents give her. I have a rule of on supporting your kids. It should just be one notch above their ambition level. Because if you're way too much, then you're dragging them through the process. If it's too little, you're not supporting them, mm -hmm. right? So one notch above. And then the last one is the player has to have ambition and drive and a desire to do better, better in life, better in the skills, better in the sport, whatever it may be. And so I think that we do a really poor job. I mean, how many times have you gone to a high school? Maybe I'm outdated because I haven't been around high school for a little while. But how many times have you gone to tryouts where the coach before you even try out says, these are the expectations. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. And if you don't want to try out, if you don't want to be part of that, then don't try out. The process is everyone should want to try out for us because we are who we are. Try out. And then when you decide that you don't like this four weeks in, well, it's because you're not good enough. Hmm. We haven't set clear expectations. Uh, my nephew just quit playing football because he realized he wanted his summers. He could be a very good football player, but he recognized, you know what? I don't have the desire to do this. So I'm going to focus heavily on lacrosse, which he's also very good at. What an 
what a mature decision. Because everything in our culture is you should do this and you should gut yourself to do it. And he realized that he liked being around his friends a lot more than he liked being in that environment. I also think that it was valuable to recognize that there was one sport that he really wanted to put all of his efforts into at that certain age. I think there's a certain age where you should start prioritizing. Again, that's a whole nother conversation on another podcast, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that in this situation, he recognized that there was not an enjoyment for this and there was an enjoyment for that. And I'm going to go push myself. I think that we are not doing a good enough job as um, leaders in our sports community of really clearly defining what it is that they're trying out for. I use the analogy all the time. You go into the supermarket and, and purchase Lucky Charms or Medios. And why? Well, when you shut, when you when you show up to tryouts, are, do you have that option? Is there is there a label of contents? Is it what's the time commitment? What are your expectations? How much is this going to cost? All those different variables go into a good experience. On uh, there's a, the book Good to Great where he talks about getting the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. If you don't ever put out those expectations, how do you how do you get the right people on the right bus? to have the desired environment, outcome, so on and so forth. I think that's a large part of this is that there's different buses. I mean, we have buses that travel the country and we have buses that just do the same loop over and over in Cache Valley, right? Mm -hmm. They both serve a purpose, but I know when I'm getting on the, the bus locally that I'm just going to go in a loop. If I get on Greyhound, I'm probably going to go on a long distance trip. We do a really poor job in my opinion, and again, this comes back to being well-intended liars, we make it easy for them to be part of our program instead of clear to decide if they want to be part of our program. And I think that sometimes we're afraid to do that in fear that being honest with them and telling them what they're actually being part of, hey, you're going to train two to three days a week and you can't be late or this is the consequence or you can't play another sport on this team because it's such a high level commitment that you don't have time for anything else. And then all of a sudden it all falls apart halfway through the season. We're scratching our head. Why? It's because we haven't vetted the, we haven't, we haven't vetted the parents, players and formed them and helped them make a decision before they show up to play on what they perceive as the best team. That's great. And if I were to summarize our conversation here, going back to where we began, Youth coaches are the most well-intended liars on the face of the planet. Right. That's We've a really big about... part. The well-intended is a very big part. Yep. I don't think anyone out there is purposely lying to kids. I want that to be really clear. Well-intended is a key part of that quote is everyone involved is trying their best to do what's right. Are we aware? Are, can we become more aware of how we present the experience to our players and our, and our families? And I heard kind of three ways if I, one is we need to help kids really see where they're at and be honest with them and tell them where they're at, it, especially in relation. And this is the second one is, hey, we need to be honest with kids about the price to get where they want to go. Right. And not, yeah, if you want to play college soccer, like there is a price to be paid and here's what we've learned about what that price is. And then the third way that we cannot be well-intended liars is let people know what they're getting into. What's the commitment? What's our philosophy? What do we put up with? What do we not put up with? What are the right. consequences? And, you know, we had a, a recent podcast where we talked about a rule that the Utah Youth Soccer Association has put in the zero right. tolerance rule. This is one of those things. Hey, if your kid's going to play for our soccer club, this is what you will not do as a parent. If you're the kind of parent that can't live by that, <laughs> you know, it's going right. to be the expectation. There will be consequences. And so, uh, you know, and so I love that. Be honest with kids about where they're at. Be honest with kids about the price to get where they want to go. And be honest with them about expectations of being part of a team or a club. And, and so how we could not be well-intended liars is just by being authentic in those areas. And I think that's a, a great summary and something that we'll 
will help coaches, will help club directors, will help parents to really not just not not be well intended liars. Is, is yeah. you put it. So I, I I would I would put a missing piece in there that the the other fact is on the parent side, are we seeking out these things? Or are we just going with the with whatever is the most convenient or you've been told is the greatest? When you show up, are you actually holding them accountable, these organizations accountable to what it is that they said that they were going to do? So I think that that's part of this too is an effect of this is that we finally give an opportunity for the parents to actually be in control of the environment, not to the sense that they're controlling the environment, but they get to choose the environment that their kids are in based off of what, what they really want to get out of their experience. I think that's a really hard, that's a really big part of this is the more transparent we are and the, and, and, and the more we do those three things and create clarity, the easier it is for parents to make a good decision for their kids to have a successful, I say successful, meaning not just being in, in the headlines, but having a successful experience where they love what they're doing and they learn how to be good people and learn from their ups and downs. Do parents really have any way to identify what that is before they show up? So I think that by being aware that we're well-intended liars and trying to figure out that process, we are doing the best service we possibly can to the parents because we're creating a transparent option for them. And now they get to decide if they want to be part of it or not, instead of just gathered in and hope that hope for the best and hope that my kid shows up and gets selected on the right team and the coach is the right person and the club is the right club. So I think that's a big benefit, big um, benefit from this is that the parents have more clarity prior to signups. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking time with us today on the Sportlight Podcast to explain that phrase. I loved it when I heard it. I love it more now. You know, we are well intended. I love how you emphasize that, liars. And if we weren't, it would be better for everybody. So thank you for taking the time to help us understand that phrase. And, and we appreciate all of you for joining the Sportlight Podcast. We encourage you to subscribe to this, to share it with your friends and and those who would be interested. And as always, keep your eyes up, do the work. This has been the Sportlight Podcast from Especially for Athletes, sponsored by Coca-Cola. You can learn more about Especially for Athletes by visiting the website at especiallyforathletes.org. You can also learn more about the book, The Sportlight, by Shad Martin and Dustin Smith at especiallyforathletes.org book.